Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you. This is our first like, in-person large audience event in almost three years. Um, and I should say, if we seem a little rusty on some of the logistics, you know why. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Leo Chavez. Um, I should say first that this is sponsored by the Mellon Foundation, which also sponsors two of our Latino Studies scholars every year. So they owe, uh, we owe a lot to the Mellon Foundation. For um, Leo is a member of the Anthropology Department at the University of California, California Irvine, and a native son of New Mexico. And my understanding, he's got some familia here. Welcome, welcome, bienvenidos. He received his PhD from Stanford University. After conducting fieldwork in Ecuador, he decided to turn his focus to transnational migration. His books include Shadowed Lives, Undocumented Immigrants in America, which has gone through multiple editions. Another book, Covering Immigration, Popular Images and the Poetics of the Nation. Sorry, the Politics of the Nation. Uh, not much poetry there. And, uh, and The Latino Threat, Constructing Immigrants, Citizens, and the Nation. Anchor Babies and the Challenge of Birthright Citizenship. That was published by Stanford University Press in 2017. Professor Chavez is a recipient of many important awards, including the Margaret Mead Award in 1993 and the Society for the Anthropology of North Americans Award for a Distinguished Achievement in 2009. He was elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2017. Um, before I uh, hand the microphone to Professor Chavez, I just want to say that he will answer He'll respond to some questions at the end, three or four. He, uh, since Santa Fe rolls up the streets at about eight o'clock, I want to get this man and his family to, or, and other members of our group to a restaurant before they close. So we'll only be able to take a few questions. Uh, please join me in welcoming Leo Chavez. Well, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to SAR for inviting me uh, here today. And I want to thank Paul for the initial invitation before COVID, and then uh, COVID hit and I couldn't come. And they asked me if I'd like to do it on Zoom. And I said, are you kidding? And Miss Green Chili and Red Chili? How would I ever do that? So, so I waited out COVID and made it, and here I am. So thank goodness. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Madigan for doing all the logistics and making sure I had a the hotel room and, and everything else that we're doing. So thank you very much for all of that. And uh, I just may say, first of all, that, as I said, you know, I'm 13th generation New Mexican. And according to 123andMe and Ancestry.com, I'm literally related to everybody in this state and half of, and half of California and half of Texas, I guess. And I didn't believe it till I gave this talk and I see so many of my relatives here, which puts the pressure on me. Uh, my wife told me, you better do a good job. And I said, so she made me actually practice, prepare this talk for hours. And I go, I never practiced this much. <laughs> what are you doing to me? So my talk is about the emotional toll of anti-immigrant and anti-Latino uh, rhetoric. That's what I work on most recently. Um, uh, I'm writing a book right now, right on that. And um, you're going to get little touches of it maybe. And uh, it'll probably come out in Stanford Press again. I, Stanford's my go-to press usually, uh, except for UC Press that did my other book. But and uh, so hopefully that'll come out in a couple of years. And um, that's how long it takes. And so I'm talking about rhetoric. You, it's hard to watch the news these days without hearing the word political rhetoric. It's everywhere. Everyone uses the term. I mean, it's just amazing. So consequently, my topic is on political rhetoric. The issue is I'm looking at is very few people ask the question, what about the people who this rhetoric targets? Because a lot of it's pretty hate-filled rhetoric. How does it make people feel when they're the target? So I'm going to come to that later. But just a quick definition of rhetoric. Rhetoric is a rational study and artful practice of human symbol use when and where those tar symbols target identifiable communities of interest to create, enhance, undermine, or otherwise influence human belief, attitude, emotion, judgment, and behavior. And we see a lot of rhetoric today in the world. Rhetoric's incredibly persuasive if you use it well, and people do use it well. But I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of rhetoric of presidential rhetoric, actually, to kind of set the stage to get to my end point where I really want to go. So I'm going to give you some exa a couple of examples. The first one comes from 1980. You all remember that. Many of us are old enough to re remember that date. There was a debate between the first George Bush 
and Ronald Reagan, both of whom would eventually become president of the United States. They were asked, in a setting like this, a, a question, uh, do you think the children of illegal aliens should attend schools free, or do you think their parents should pay for their education? And remember, 1980 was two years before Plyler v. Doe, which was a Supreme Court decision that said that all children have, should have a right to go to school and mandatory to go to school because it's in the state's interest to make sure children grow up educated and become good citizens. So this is two years before that. So the issue still was relatively fresh in the political discourse. So George Bush says in his, his political rhetoric of the time and how he saw the world this. We have made illegal sometimes the labor I would like to see legal. We're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law. And second, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. If they're living here, I can't do his accent, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to see six and eight-year-old kids made totally uneducated, made to feel they're living outside the law. These are good people. These are strong people. So what do you think Ronald Reagan, who came up next, said? You'll be surprised. His response upped George Bush. Rather than talking about putting up a fence, why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems? Make it possible for them to come here legally with a work permit. And then when they want to go back, they can go back. Open the borders both ways. When he became president, he said in 1984, I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and have lived here even though sometime back they may have entered illegally. I mean, it's almost a time of innocence compared to today. When was this fantasy world these presidential candidates were living in that they could make these kind of statements? Of course, Ronald Reagan signed an amnesty bill in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, that legalized over a million undocumented immigrants. And we haven't done it since. Let's jump ahead 35 years. On the first day of announcing his, his bid to become President of the United States, Donald Trump, on June 16th, said this to open his campaign. When, and we all know this. I don't even have to say it. This is part of our heritage now. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists, and some I assume are good people. What happened in 35 years that the political rhetoric of president, people who can become president of the United States, could become so radically, radically divergent? I can't answer that at all, but I can touch on a couple of things. Because, you know, we have here two diametrically opposed rhetorics about the same exact topic, immigration. I want to make very clear, when I use Trump's rhetoric, I want to make clear, he didn't invent anything he says. He's very good at rhetoric, however, and seeing what sells and can use it to his advantage. That's what a, someone who uses rhetoric well can do. He didn't invent anything. That's the point I'm going to make here. Everything Donald Trump says emerges in political discourse over the last 50 years. I wrote a book called Covering Immigration, UC Press, in 1991, if you want to buy it, feel free. And where I, I show this, and this is way before Trump emerges on the political scene, right? And what happens is that, what I show is that since the 1970s, anti-immigrant, anti-Latino rhetoric becomes incredibly strong and incredibly much more harsh over those decades. Okay. So he didn't invent any of this, but he builds on it relatively well. So I have three goals tonight, and I, hopefully I can keep in time. I forgot to look at my watch. Uh, first one, I want to present a few examples of the anti-immigrant, anti-Latino rhetoric I'm talking about. You can buy my books, and you can actually see them in much more detail. So I'm just trying to give a few examples. I'm not trying to sell my books, but buy them. That's good. We, I don't have any here, unfortunately. Um, second, I want to briefly explain why immigration will probably increase over the next number of decades, despite the fear and anxiety and, 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 and rhetoric about immigration that people are using for short-term gain, the long-term is we're going to have immigration. And I'll give you my final conclusion. Learn to live with it and make the best out of it. Okay? 
because it's not going to go away, and I'm going to show you that in part two really quickly. Part three is what I'm really interested in right now, and that is I want to answer the question, what does it mean to be the target of neg negative political rhetoric that we hear so often and is so glibly tossed at, at human beings just trying to live their lives the best they can? How do they feel about that? How do they feel about that? So that's what I want to come to. So part one. Immigrants and Latinos are blamed and scapegoated for the fears some people have about immigration and changing demographics in the United States. The same kind of fears that are all over Europe, Iran, as I'll talk about, Japan, for all the same reasons. It's not unique to us. You, people can use those fears, however, in the current political climate around the world. Like I said, my book, readily available, you see, at Amazon.com. So what are some of the elements or the threats that I'm talking, the fears that are part of this Latino threat narrative, as I call it? And I don't want to, exp I could, this could be two hour talk. I'm a professor, actually literally probably five hours, but I'm a, I just give you some, there's a debate around whether young people who come here as children, many sometimes six months old, live their whole lives here, speak English, go to school, want to contribute, should we give them a path to citizenship? Seems like an obvious thing, but this idea that Latinos are criminals makes it hard for people to come to some sort of conclusion. Here's an example about the debate over Dreamers and DACA students. This is Steve King who said that for every one who's a valedictorian, there's another 100 out there that weigh 130 pounds and they've got calves the size of cantaloupes because they're hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert. In other words, for every one good student who has a dedication to America and wants to contribute, 99% are criminals. How do you make a decision about the future of these young people if that's the kind of rhetoric that's, that's flailing it? This image, I use it, I, picked, I just picked this one out because this and what other ones like it are, have been used for the last two decades in multiple political ads. You'll notice Sherry Engel, I, mean, I could just go and give you a ton of people who've used this type of ad. There's no, you don't have to say anything else to raise the fear to get, ask people to vote for. You just have to show some brown young guys and say, illegal aliens, my God, I'm going to go vote for this person because I've got to be protected by these monsters. But there's no data here. There's no biographies. There's no histories of these people. Would it, I want to give you a little history. Would it make you less scared of these three guys if I told you that front guy was a friend of my, fr my son's at Stanford and he was in the medical school? The guy on the right, a pretty famous uh, editor of films, and the guy on the left just happened to walk in and got his picture shot, his, his Zoom bombing. Does that make you feel less? There's no bio. You don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. I just made that up. Because I can add biographies to them too. But I'll tell you this. Those three young men had never been to the United States. This shot was taken in Mexico City, downloaded for the use in political ads. Because the important point, they're brown, they're young, and they're scary. Fact check. I could... Academia is another narrative, which we tell, and there's thousands of data on this issue of crime, okay? And you're going to hear about it because right now one of the number one issues in America is crime and fear. So you're going to hear a lot of it. The fact is, go on the internet and look up all the studies that have been done by the government, by academics. This is just one example. National Academy of Sciences has some cred in the world for academics. Found, after reviewing all the data they could find, that Increased prevalence of immigrants is associated with lower crime rates, the opposite of what many Americans fear. Among men 18 to 39, the foreign-born are incarcerated, put in prison at a rate that is one-fourth the rate of the native-born. Cities and neighborhoods with greater concentrations of immigrants have much lower rates of crime and violence than comparable non-immigrant neighborhoods. El Paso, we're supposed to have a war on the border. Safe city. Safe city. Across the border, not so safe. But the point is, you know, there's a lot of fear, but you can get on the internet and check it for yourself. I could just do this all day and show you that stuff. The other aspect of the Latino threat is that Latinos don't want to assimilate. They don't want to learn English. They don't want to have friends who are non-Latino. They want to reproduce their own culture, live in their own neighborhoods, and stay apart from the rest of society, as I'll talk about later, because they want to invade and take over. Okay? Just a couple of examples. Uncle Sam saying, I want you to assimilate. That's the idea, right? 
or this one. I want you to speak English or get out. Of course, Donald Trump didn't invent those. These have been going on for 40, 50 years, but he used it really well. We have a country where to assimilate, you have to speak English. This is a country where we speak English, not Spanish. I hate to tell people this. Reality check, we're in Santa Fe. I just came from Los Angeles and California. Where do you think these words came from? And as I look and I'm driving around, I see a lot of words I don't know because they're in languages that are Native American. In the mid-1700s, New York City had 35 languages that were not English that were spoken. Any Latinos in here? Do you understand me? I'm speaking the English. And it's absurd, and it's in, on prima facie evidence, it's absurd, but I'll give you real evidence. This, you know, we have a census every 10 years. The last census showed us that if you're worried about people integrating and learning English, just look at the data. Over 90% of Latin Ameri children, US born children of Latin American immigrants, European or Russian, Asian or Middle East, and African speak English. There's no, the rhetoric is, has its own life. That doesn't mean as an academic I have to buy it, because I can just look at it, I can look up data. The Latino threat also says, that we've seen over the last 50 years, that Latinas have high fertility levels, they're a reproductive threat. And that makes their children a threat, not just immigrants, okay? Here's an example from the 1980s. Invasion from Mexico, it just keeps growing. You see a tank? Do you see a gun? Do you see any weapons? What do you see? You see the queen bee of, of reproduction being carried across to the other side of the water, right? And in the narrative of American immigration, when you see brown people and you see water, you know you got a wet back, right? So, they're not bringing guns, they're bringing women who create families, who create neighborhoods, who pretty soon are gonna have a takeover to reproduction, okay? Here's an example of what you see. Turn on any CSI, any of those movies, what are you gonna see? There's no representation of Latinos except the pregnant woman and all her kids and her drunk partner who doesn't, or stone partner, who has nothing else. That's our representation. That's the story that's told constantly, day in, day out on the media. Reality check, and I'm gonna come back to reproduction. Just go, my friend, a sociologist, gave me this data. He said, you know, people don't keep talking about these Latinas who have high fertility and, and it never changes because of Catholicism, and to be a woman means to have lots of babies, to be a man means to impregnate everybody in the world that you can impregnate. But if you just look at the 1970s, you know, Mexican origin women had 4.4 kids and Anglo women had 3.5 by 2000. Both of them were under zero population. I'm gonna come back to this, so I'm not gonna belabor this point right now, because this is fundamental to understanding why we have a demand for immigration. It takes 2.1 kids to have population growth. Anything under two, that's two, two kids and an arm, basically. Anything under that is zero population, okay? I'll come back to this, because this is super important. Another Latino threat, invasion and reconquest. This theme really came up as post-1965 immigration law, immigration starts to build. Okay, so that people start getting worried about all this immigration. And you start seeing this idea of a reconquest and an invasion coming. This is from the 70s. 1977, time bomb in Mexico, while there'll be no end to the invasion. By, I want to use the word invasion as a meta, military metaphor. Your friends come over to watch the Super Bowl. Invaders come in to steal your women, take your land, and kill you. That's an important term to use, okay? It immediately creates an enemy, us, them, Frederick. What's the time bomb in Mexico? The ticking clock of fertility. They have too many kids and can't support them. By the way, I, I got to touch this because I'm not going to come back to it. This never happened. Mexican fertility dropped. Today, no Mexicans hardly come to the United States. It's from Central America, South America, Asia, Africa, other places. Because their fertility levels drop too. Okay? But people start seeing this rhetoric about the invasion, and here you have 1977, you have the Grand Dragon, the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke doing a border spectacle, where he goes along the border, puts a sheet on there, they love sheets, and he puts Klan border watch, they go down there to monitor the border, because they just read on Newsweek and Time Magazine and on news that there's an invasion. So the Klan has to go down and monitor the invasion. And of course, this is the 
progenitor to all the militias we have along the border, including, for example, this example from New Mexico, where this militia detains 2,000 asylum seekers, not immig undocumented immigrants, at gunpoint, illegally. But there's lots of those. I want to bring this one up. I know, I hope my time's not going out because I have to get to the other two. But I want to use this one because New Mexicans have to see this one. This is from 1980s. Will Mexican migration create a new nation? In other words, they want to come over and take over. The disappearing border, you have the red, white, and blue of the U.S. The red and blue are already fading into history. The red of the Mexican flag and the green, what's left of the U.S., the white, is already on a field of green, the Mexican flag. And little Mexican folkloric people from the 1800s are walking across into Mex in the United States. And the border between Mexico and the U.S. is gone. And the red is purging itself. The blood of Mexico is coming north. Right? And if you don't get it, here's what they said. And this is a paranoid story that if I was a psychiatrist and someone came in and gave me this story, I'd give them drugs immediately. But they wrote this, okay? Now sounds the march of the new conquistadors in the American Southwest, which we're in right now. The heirs of Cortez and Coronado are rising again in the land their forebears took from their Indians and lost to the Americans. Their movement is, despite its quiet and largely peaceful nature, God, those guys are tricky, is both an invasion and a revolt. At the vanguard of those born here, it's not just immigrants, it's generations of Latinos who've been here, whose roots are generations deep. Now, this is interesting to me because, as I said, I'm 13th generation, as my cousins all are here too. Give you And um, <laughs> just to remind you, Cortez conquered the Aztecs in 1519 to 1521. Coronado had a couple of expeditions, right? 1500s, early 1600s. The first Chavez came in the second expedition. So we're being told that for four to 500 years, we've been planning a takeover of the United States. And let me remind you, there was nobody on the east coast of this land at the time we were here. That is far-sighted thinking, <laughs> to be thinking about taking over people who haven't even come yet. And it's interesting to me, if I've been here 13 generations, how come I never got a tweet that says, tonight we kill white people? Get your guns ready. Because <laughs> this is an absurd idea. It's an absurd idea. And yet, a major magazine, it's not Donald Trump, a major center magazine could create this fantasy that people buy into. The Latino, the Latino threat and the demographic threat, basically the changing face of America, the fact that whites are no longer going to be a majority raises fears. Some time in the next 10, 20 years, America's going to be a minority dominant. Nobody's going to have a majority. And people are afraid. But let me tell you, California, we're already a minority state. My school, whites, you know, whatever white means, because it changes all the time. You know, as I'll talk about, 1924, we kicked and stopped Italians, Czechoslovakians, Russian Jews, Greeks from coming to the United States because they weren't white. Can you believe I imagine that? So whatever white means 20, 30 years from now, I have no idea, right? But what's happening here is that people get really afraid of the fact that once you're a minority and no one's a majority, that they're going to get treated like it, they treated other people, I guess. But, you know, my school, whites are 23%. As I can see, my students treat them very well. A couple of whites are on the basketball team. You know, we gave, we, we gave them the water polo team. I mean, it's like people talk to them. There's been no violence, right? But I don't know what people are so afraid of. It's worked out pretty well for us. Uh, I'll skip this because I'm running out of time. Latinos are takers. They don't pay taxes. They just want to come here and get everything for free. And, you know, I could just, once again, I could spend an hour just doing this. But let me give you a couple of facts, because when I talk about now what I'm showing in my experiment, these are the kind of points I'm making as positive rhetoric. Immigrants contribute an estimated $115 billion more to the Medicare trust fund than they took out between 2002 and 2009. I'm over 65, and I'll tell you, I just want to say, get on my knees and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this gift for these taxes you're paying, you'll never get. And economists have been saying for decades that Social Security is dead. But you know what's keeping it alive? The contribution in taxes by immigrants will never get it back. Undocumented immigrants nationally add $276 billion to Social Security over the next 10 years in a, in a, in a, product, in a study done in 2013, but costs only $33 billion. Once again, I get Social Security. Thank you. Thank you, and you'll never get it back. That's a gift to us. That's just a pure gift, okay? Thank you. 
And then don't forget the anchor baby fear, right, that came out in the early 2000s. Trump didn't invent that. He used it very well, but he didn't invent it, right? Here's the anchor. Here's Mexican <laughs> at the border. I wrote a book on it, once again for sale at Amazon.com. And um, what this trope, this image does of the anchor baby, questions the citizenship of children born in the United States whose parents are undocumented. The idea that they're not citizens like the rest of us, despite the 14th Amendment that says they are, because they're born here. They're cheaters by being born here, and they're part of a conspiracy by, the, by their parents to get their parents legalized, which I could talk about how difficult that is. Here's an image that I'm using in my experiment. It has to do with squat and drop should not make an American, anyone an American. You can buy these t-shirts. Okay. Now, part two. I hope I'm not sure what time I have. I hope I'm okay. Uh, part two. The future of immigration and demographic change. Because of all the fears and the rhetoric, I just got to touch a couple of minutes to say, despite those fears, immigration is going to continue and demographic change is going to continue because that has to do with us. Not anybody coming to our border, fleeing, fleeing uh, uh, a down economy like in, in Venezuela or fleeing uh, some dictator. This has to do with us, why people are going to come here. Why? Because the United States is a nation that has benefited from immigration since its inception. This is from the, the, it's the immigration in the United States since 1840 up until today. And you'll see the blue line, tons of immigrants are coming today, post-1965 immigration law. But the important one is the red line. That's the percentage of foreign-born in our nation. That's a relevant one because more immigrants come, but we have more people to absorb them. So from the mid late 1800s till today, it's always been about 13, 14 percent. It's never changed, except when it's gone down. Now this is going to change, as I'm going to tell you about, because of the factors that's increasing a demand for immigrants that has to do with us. We can blame other people. They want our burgers and they love our hamburgers and our green chili here, but that's not the issue. It's us. What is it about us? What factors influence immigration? And how do we, as a people, influence that? So, you can just have a look around downtown Santa Fe. America is green, okay? Just, just look at me and my relatives. 65 and older are projected to double in size in the coming decades. 65 and older, 15% of the population in 2016. By, by 2060, they're going to be 25%, one out of every four people. And they're going to be getting on their knees thanking those people who are paying into Medicare, Medi-Cal, and, and, and Social Security, because they're the ones that are going to get it. If I was, I am 65 and over, I'd say, bring them in. Let them work, because they're supporting me. It's almost unbelievable that people would have a negative reaction to that kind of support for people who are over 65. The other thing about people over 65 is that they don't, they're getting out of the labor market, they aren't working, and they don't have kids. Now, there's a lot of young men in here you know, they go through something called menopause after 45 or so. They take a pause from men. They, aren't gonna, they don't have many babies, okay, after 45. As you age, and what happens then, you just look at the data that came out of the 2020 census. Every single gr group you can look at in America, except for Native Hawaiians and Native Pacific Islanders, who seem to be very prolific, um, are zero population. There's zero growth. Hispanics, who everyone says have a lot of babies, no. Blacks, no. Whites, no. American Indians and Alaskans, no. Asians, way low. Okay? What's that tell you? We're just like the rest of the industrial world that has incredibly low fertility rates. Okay? They're so low, they're begging women to have babies. Done like us, they give people years off, two years to have a baby. Their husbands, too. They give them all kinds of social services because they want... In Iran... They're actually asking women to have babies in Iran. And women don't want to have babies. I mean, that's the way the world is right now. And not surprisingly, every nation in the world that has high, low fertility has high immigration. Okay, and I'll explain to you why. But let me add one other factor. Deaths in America are starting to outnumber births. Half of all states have deaths, more deaths than they have babies being born. Okay, isn't that amazing? A third of states in America have lost population. Okay? Fertility, demographics, or destiny. Okay? 
Let me give you another little simple equation I made up and I put in my books that people never recognize. Because they always say, oh, why are those Venezuelans coming over here? Why are those people? Well, we're, let's look at us. We're capitalists. Capitalism is based on one major premise. We're going to have more jobs today than we did yesterday. That's growth. If you don't have growth, that arrow, you have recession. That arrow drops down. If that arrow drops down too long, it's a depression. Nobody wants a depression. If I'm old, who's going to pay taxes in a depression and a recession for my Social Security? No one. It's going to get bleak. So we want job growth. That's, that's the nature of capitalism. The bottom line is births. Remember this equation. There's only two ways to get a worker in an economic system. You either birth them or you import them. Now, we all watch Lord of the Rings. They made orcs. We don't make orcs. Okay? You either birth them or you import them. We're not birthing them. In the 2008 recession, for three years, American women weren't having kids. Why? Because who's going to have a kid in a recession? But what happens 18 to 20 years after that recession? And I'm an employer. I say, I want to hire, hire me some kids because I'm going to develop some, some jobs here. They say, oh, sorry, man. Those, those babies weren't born in 2008, 2009. Give me some immigrants. Right now, we have really low unemployment. Some places, for every person who replies to a job wanted sign, there are three or four jobs that no one replies for. You just have, I don't know, I, what amazed me is I'm going out to restaurants, they say, well, you can't sit here, we don't have servers. Oh, you can't take this plane, we don't have people to demand the plane. We don't have pilots, we don't have this, we don't have that. Well, that's what we're talking about here. A loss of workers. U.S. Chamber of Commerce says, you know, America's shortage is just people just aren't recognizing it. But it's good to work people up about immigrants coming to our border. When the reality is, we need people in transportation, truck drivers, pilots, anything else, health care, taking care of our elderly, taking care of our kids, taking care of everybody else, the nurses, taking care of food services, accommodations, hotels. This is a hotel community, right? It's just amazing how much we need. This is, this is what's happening where I live, too. It's just you don't have the workers. We're not birthing the workers. You import the workers then. That's basically all you can do. So why is immigration going to continue the next few years? Next three or four decades, actually. Low fertility, aging populations, high death rates. And remember, don't forget, the Oxycontin and the drug issue right now for working class kids of all backgrounds, particularly young whites, who feel they're never going to make it to their parents' level, they're called deaths of despair, affect their community almost more than any other. So white decline, not just because Latinos are having babies, because people are just in despair over inequality, lack of ability to get ahead, all kinds of issues they feel bad about. <coughs> so we have a labor shortage, economic growth, demands for labor. All of these put pressure on more immigration. That's what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. The census predicts that in 2020, right now, we have a historical average of the number of Un, of, of, of foreign born in the United States, about 14%. By 2060, it's going to go to an unprecedented level, 17% of our population. For all those factors, it has nothing to do with what's going on in Venezuela, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening in Man. It has to do with the fact, if we don't get them, we're going to be in big trouble. And that's the whole industrialized world. So, let me get to part three. I think I have some time. Emotions. Because every all the rhetoric I've talked about is about emotion. It's about emotion. It's about how people feel about things, right? And so I ask the question: How does it feel? What's it feel like to be the target of negative political rhetoric, like in the first part? And so I did an experiment with a colleague of mine who's a psychologist, and I set up a lab. But what motivated me, what I wanted to really know, is how people feel, was a quote like this that came out in the LA Times in 2018: A white woman in Running Springs, California, right close where I live approached Esteban Guzman, a U.S. citizen, and his mother, who were gardening, and told them from her car, go back to Mexico, and unleashed other anti-Mexican rants. Guzman said, why do you hate us? And she replied, because you're Mexicans. And he said, we're honest people. She, the woman laughed and said, you're rapists, drug dealers, even the president of the United States says you're a rapist. And Guzman turns to the reporter who's interviewing him and says, thanks to him, Donald Trump, everywhere I go, I'm a rapist, an animal, a drug dealer. You don't know what it feels like to be hated so much. That's what my experiment, psychological experiment, was about. That's what I wanted to understand. And so, 
I wanted to, I, I chose a, a group of people, young uh, people of Mexican descent, and I wanted to see how they would respond to political rhetoric, both positive and negative, some of which I just shown you actually, uh, that places them particularly in the crosshairs of the debate around politics of immigration and the nation and the future of the nation. What does it feel like to be in that situation? So I got, I randomly assigned 95 students uh, in a lab, and they looked at negative political rhetoric about Latinos and immigrants. I randomly assigned another 93 and showed them positive political rhetoric, and they were shown two statements and two images each on each of those, positive and negative. One group saw this, one group saw that. I asked students, they were sitting in front of a computer, they didn't see me, an undergraduate who didn't know what the student study was about, had them log on and do this. And they were asked, after they saw these examples of rhetoric, both positive and negative, one or the other, how do you feel when you see these statements? And the second question is, what do you think? I wanted to get at both their emotion and their rational thought. And they wrote extensively in response to both of those questions. I have a paper that came out, if anybody's interested, just looking at those qualitative responses. But we also asked the standard psychological questions for measuring stress, perceived health status, and perceived well-being. That's a little more quantitative paper, which I'm not going to bore you with all the quantification. I'm not going to show you, you know, regression analyses, which I, I have here if you want to see them, by the way, but because it's just too much. You're not students in my class. And um, to look at and see, can we measure the effect of positive and negative impact and the difference between the two on how people feel about themselves and their lives? The idea was, and the, and the model I kind of drew up, was that political rhetoric stimulates emotions, whether it's positive or negative, which influence perceived stress, subjective health status. How do you feel about your health? Do you feel like you're healthy right now or not healthy? And your subjective well-being, how does that emotional response to those images and that, that rhetoric make you feel about yourself in the world? Right? And so that was the idea. Here, just to remind you of some of the rhetoric I've shown you, what I used on the negative rhetoric, I want you out, squat and drop, and they read things like this, which you know, you've already seen, right? You're rapists, um, uh, uh, valedictorian, they're all, they're all uh, uh, basically bad people. And when they wrote, here's some of the code word, key words that came out in their responses. You can see it stimulated them extremely, right? They were using all these kind of words. My job, of course, is to code these and come up, and you can read my paper how I coded them, to come some, put some patterns into the response, but basically, the ones who saw the negative rhetoric, it was very clear that sticks and stones can break your bones and words can really kick your butt, right? They really hurt. Participants who viewed negative political rhetoric frequently included words such as sad, upset, angry, hurt, offended, and I feel really, feel really bad. I feel really bad that people say this about me and my family and my people who like me. This one woman, I'm not going to give you, I have a 45-page paper just on these responses, which you're welcome to have you email me, and I'll send them to you. As she said, she's a 24-year-old Mexican-American woman, by that I mean born in the United States. She said, you know, these images, you know, they make me, ang they're anger, rage, frustration, impotence, they're just some of the words that come to mind. But I have so much to say that I'm, I'm not able to properly articulate. She becomes speechless. What I'm trying to say, much less express myself in a healthy manner, these types of regressions are not new to me, so I know what it's like to have these words and images being shouted. They aren't just, you just, you just don't just look at them, they shout at her, right? They shout off the page, off the computer. They shout at you, making you feel out of place, ashamed, inferior, even though you were born in the United States. We have undocumented students, legal immigrant students, but even for US citizens, born in the United States, going to a major university of California, this is the way they felt. We found, looking at the statistical analysis of the psychological uh, uh, questions, that exposure to negative rhetoric compared to those who saw the positive rhetoric significantly increased negative emotions, which in turn raised their stress levels, which we asked after they saw them, lowered their subjective health, in comparison to those who saw the pot, they felt sick. They felt physically ill. They lowered their subjective well-being. They felt out of place, unwelcome. All those issues. 
Then we looked at what happens when we show them, po po I want not just the negative side of rhetoric, I wanted the positive side too. So we showed them some of those positive things I, I mentioned to you already, which is also rhetoric, academic rhetoric. And we, you know, basically, words and images can hurt, but positive political rhetoric can have a healthy effect, we found. It can make people feel better about themselves. And this re just to show you some of the stimuli we gave them, you know, this is people becoming Americans at a swearing-in ceremony you know, for new citizens. This is the image of the uh, students who come to America and want to become Americans and get an education. And, and the, the DREAM Act, this is their symbol of the DREAM Act, right? And we showed them stuff like that. And we had them read things like, Today, there are hundreds of thousands of students excelling in our schools who came as undocumented immigrant children. They were brought up by their parents through no fault of their own. They grew up as Americans and pledged allegiance to our flag. They've lived a good life. They've proven themselves. They've beaten the odds. They are talented, responsible young people who could be staffing our research labs or starting a new business and who could be further enriching this nation, which I took right out of the debate in Congress. Okay. I don't have to invent things. <laughs> it's not my job. Another thing they read positively was that immigrants contribute to our society, and you saw this already, about the millions of billions of dollars in taxes they're paying into Social Security and other things. So they looked at that. Look at this keyword map compared to the last one I showed you. Proud. Happiness. Pride. I mean, it's just it's, uh, you know, beneficial, inspiring, empowerment. You know, Chris, I had to code all those, all those in various ways to make see the kind of patterns, but here's basically the, the gist of it. Those who viewed positive political rhetoric often used words such as proud, happy, benefit, empowered, contribution, and community. None of the words we saw in relationship to the negative rhetoric. Okay? This is an example of a quote from a U.S.-born Mexican-American woman. I have so many quotes, I just put, pick these ones. As a Mexican-American, I feel proud reading the quotes and seeing the images. I feel very emotional because in the present day, <clears throat> uh, immigrants, in, in the present day, individuals discriminate not only against immigrants, but their children. I am glad to see that we are contributing to society, and I wish Americans would see that. I wish they can see that we are not harming their country. We are helping it grow. Very insightful. I mean, I was impressed. I said, are these the students in my classes? I, I know maybe all these, ever, anybody writing like this. But we found, basically, we looked at the analysis of the statistical data that positive rhetoric creates positive emotions, which in turn lower their stress levels compared to those who saw the negative rhetoric. Raised their subjective health, how they perceived their health. They felt healthy compared to those who felt sick. They had a higher subjective sense of well-being. They felt good about their place in the world, their place in society, their community. I mean, it's just, it's just such a contrast. So in conclusion, I know I've taken up a lot of time, I really came to realize that words really do matter. You know, they're not just something that's out there than passes, that people really get affected about it. If we talk negatively about people, they can feel stigmatized as outsiders, as unwanted, as disposable, as people who don't matter, all in a phrase, all in an inflection, all in an ad. If we speak positively about people, they feel good about themselves and their sense of belonging to their community and the nation. Isn't that what we really want? People who feel like they belong and they contribute, do something for all of us? My point is that, based upon my research, is that we can determine the type of nation we want to be simply by thinking about the language we use when we speak about each other. It's such a simple idea, right? It's such a simple idea, but if the data holds up, you know, we can demonize immigrants and Latinos for immigration and demographic changes that are occurring, or we can recognize the factors that influence immigration and say, they aren't to blame. Immigration is something we need. Let's figure out a way to deal with it. Let's figure out a way to make it work. Immigration has benefits to the nation and has for the last 200 and something years. And we need policies that are built on our needs, not on our fears. We need to integrate the nation, not divide the nation. And language is one of the key ways to do that. Thank you very much.
So it's just rhetoric. You don't have to believe anything I said. <laughs> you, can take, you can take some questions if you're. Um, the best thing would be if you could just speak loudly, because so that everybody can hear you, and we can repeat the question to the group, or we can get you a microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Professor, do you think that climate change and environmental degradation has anything to do with uh, immigration? Do I? Okay. Do I think that uh, climate change and and, and, and degradation of our of our earth is going to have anything that's going to have a huge I mean those those are called you know so that that kind of migration that moves people away from where they're living because of the disasters of, of what we're creating is going to the whole world's going to change because of that I mean just you ever see a map of Florida <laughs> it's not there <laughs> half of California is going to be gone I mean where are these people going to go New Mexico looks pretty damn good, <laughs> right? And so yes, I mean, environmental change is gonna have a major impact on, on people moving to get safe. I, I'm trying to buy some land out, down in South, South Argentina, actually, <laughs> because I think that's one of the safest places to be. Go ahead. So I'm gonna go, sorry, I had a quick question about um, a different kind of demographic of migrants. Um, in Santa Fe, we tend to have a lot of migrants who are moving environmental disasters in other states, but they aren't necessarily contributing to the border divorce. How do we deal with Because they're retired already? Yeah, retiree migrants. Yeah, that's, that's an old story here too, because I mean, New Mexico is such a beautiful place, and ironically, people want to come and pretend they're Hispanic. <laughs> and, and, and enjoy what we've created here, right? Which, welcome to it, but you know, contribute back. And I remember when I was in Chimayo, where a lot of my family is from, and I was really young, and I had an aunt, Right, we lived not far from my grandmother's house, and and uh, she said to me one time that, you know, when I was really little, I said, "Oh, what's what's going on here? Do you have how's it look?" She goes, "Oh, everything's going really good, but we're having a lot of people move into Chimayo. They're buying up houses and stuff, and they don't understand the language. They don't want to they don't want to understand the language. They don't want to associate with people. They want to be separate." I said, "Really? Where are these immigrants from?" She goes, "California, New York, Boston." <laughs> <laughs> and basically, that story hasn't changed, right? And and uh, it has, like all migrations, it has positives and negatives. To tell the truth, you know, I, I personally would hate to see the, the underlying culture of New Mexico be wiped out. Yeah. Because it just has so much for the hundreds of years that we've been here that can contribute to understanding the world and, and how we should live. I mean, I'm sad that you, might, you don't see rows and rows of, of chilies being grown anymore, like when I was a kid, and corn and beans, right? And because the property values are too high. And people can make money doing other things. So it's kind of sad. You can't put the clock back. And so you're right. I mean, people come here and uh, they come to California. And uh, I personally don't see it as negative because I like pointing out and eating a different kind of food every night. I like diversity. I like all the people I talk to, ask them their stories. And it's just for me, as an anthropologist, I guess that's why I like it. I, I just, I love humanity and I enjoy it. And I think everybody who moves should enjoy the humanity where they're going so they don't live the segregated apart from them. Yeah. I'm starting to see closed, closed communities here, mm -hmm. right? Gated communities in, in northern New Mexico. Yeah. The land, and what, you know, what, what, what Latinos contributed to the southwest was open communities, no gates. People had their cattle, they, 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 everything was wide open, right? So it's a foreign concept, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can't see. Um, I was interested in the chart where you showed the correlation of low birth rate, high immigration, and I wonder if there's an overlay of those those countries that are really repressive around immigration, what their economic forecasts are as another argument for immigration. Well, it's kind of ironic because they often to be extended like in Italy right now, or even in uh, Austria and uh, some of the other countries, uh, Germany, not Germany so much. Um, they tend to be anti-immigrant to get elected, but then they quickly realize, right, we kind of, kind of need some immigrants to do some work. Even in England right now is trying, if you read the paper today or yesterday, the same, you know, they, they had Brexit. Why? Because they don't want any more immigration. That was one of the big issues. Now they're saying, gee, maybe we should bring in more people from India and, and, and to help us do some work, <laughs> right? Who's going to do all this work? And so rhetoric is one thing. Recognition of your economic needs is another, and, and, and oftentimes, they don't often match, right? But in the end, immigration in Europe is going to be, I saw one thing that for, for many of the European countries to survive as nations, they're almost going to have to double the number of people in them in the next 10 years with immigrants, or they'll just cease to exist. I mean, I'm not sure you've been, I mean, Italy, 
Spain, one of these good places where Mama Sifus, they still have large families, you can throw a rock through a daycare center and not hit a kid. I didn't do that. <laughs> but metaphorically, I thought, where are all the kids? Where are all the kids when I'm traveling there? Now we're seeing a little blip because the governments are really trying to give a lot of benefits. So I tell my students in my classes, I say, how many women here, how many of you want to have 10 kids? No one raises their hand. Maybe one guy. I say, you don't have babies. Stay out of here. And, and, and I keep, I'll keep going down. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. At three or two, some people raise their hand. Many say they never want kids. And many who want kids don't have kids because they'll wait so long. The biggest thing right now is freezing your embryos. Because they're working. They want to get ahead. They don't have time to have babies right now. So I tell them, you guys want to make money? Go to Europe. <laughs> have babies. <laughs> right. no, they'll pay you. Another question, sir? How big is the drug problem in the industry in us learning? I don't know. I really don't deal with drugs because it's one of those another rhetoric of fear that's oftentimes hard to negotiate because you have to take so many things into consideration, like the drug war in places like El Salvador, Honduras, that creates a rate of murder that is like 50 times the rate of murder in the United States. And where did those guns come from? Who created that context in the United States? Yeah. So if there's a problem with drugs coming across the border and murders and stuff, you know, we can't, like, once again, like immigration, we can't just say it's them. It's not just them. We contribute to those, those kinds of problems. And it's just, we always, you know, I don't know what the drug rate is, but I'll tell you this right now. Many Mexicans don't use drugs. The drugs that go through Mexico are for our use because we have such an insatiable demand for drugs that many people in the world will sell their souls to give us what we want, drugs. And is that good for them? No. Is it good for us? No. But it's, we're driving it. We're driving it because we want those drugs so bad that people will forfeit their families, their lives, their future existence to get us what we want. So I'm just saying, if you ever look at any equation, always make sure you're looking at both sides. Because we, we're not innocent in anything that we think we're afraid of. Sorry. Just a quick caveat. Um, it happened to me in Salvador. In El Salvador, drinking and driving is like punished by death. And in New Mexico, drinking and driving is one of the biggest problems. Yeah. I drive and I drink sometimes. I don't drink because. I'm just saying, like, there's this perception that people in other countries use a lot of substances. I know. Most of what they, they produce is for our market, unfortunately. Same thing with immigration. I mean, people don't necessarily want to come to the United States to work. Right? But we have a demand for labor. And so to satisfy it, they'll send their kids up here. They'll, they won't see their mothers and fathers for 30, 40 years. Who benefits from that? We do. We do. Right? Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Are you half South Dakota too? Yeah. No, I'm actually full blood Mexican. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Mexican from Chihuahua. Hi, Chihuahua. Uh, I moved here 26 years ago, and I've been a community organizer for 20 years in the immigrants movement. And so it's like what's so in like a lot of this information is new to me. Always been a lot of the things that you said how it makes us feel it's real. Like um, I was organizing in New Mexico when Donald Trump was the president, but you know it's like what you were saying. It's a bit before then. Uh, but what's so interesting, what's coming up for me is like this. Um, you know, we live in a capitalist society, obviously. And we we want people but we want to treat people like commodities, right? You come, but you don't speak, you don't count, and you assimilate. And if you don't assimilate, then we're going to make you criminals. And it creates this, this um, very, very uh, irrational and dangerous duality of whether you're, an, you're a criminal or you're a laborer. Like in between, we're just people, like everybody else, right? Um, and so I just, I'm, I'm a hopeful. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's why I was an organizer for 20 years. But, like, where do you see us? I just, I'm interested in, like, where do we go from here? We're in such a siloed world. I mean, look what happened in Italy, right, like, during the election this year. I mean, it's just not just happening here, right? We can isolate ourselves to see what's happening here, but this is a global problem. And we keep talking about immigration as the problem rather than seeing it as a fact of life. Mm -hmm that we have, this is how we to the world and populated the world, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, this country is who you are. If, well, I feel, as an immigrant, that if I'm not white enough, right? Like, you need to be white enough to assimilate into this country. And so, this rhetoric is all about making me 
either not belong because I'm not white enough or want to be, right? Uh, white enough, which, you know, I'm, I am who I am. And it's, there's so many layers there. I'm both an immigrant and laborer, and, you know, I, I work and I'm a daughter and I'm a community organizer, and I'm, you know, I'm a daughter, adopted daughter of New Mexico, like I do to respect your state. And I just wonder, like, what your hope is, like, what you see. And what? I, I, there's a lot of answers to your question. Number one, I'm completely against illegal immigration. Completely against it. Because I think in a country like America that bases this credo on a Judeo Christian morality to create a system where we wink and we pretend that we don't need immigrants for political reasons and we let people come in to do our work illegally is the most immoral thing. It's, it's basically slavery. And just to allow that to happen in a country like ours that's supposed to have a political center, a moral center, I don't understand why everybody's not in the streets saying, if you want workers, let them work legally under the color of law so they can avoid things like being exploited. Right? I mean, that's the, for me the fundamental thing. We need workers, admit it, Congress won't do it because they're just hitting heads. They know how to get people we need because of all, they know the factors I'm talking about. They know how many millions are going to come into work. Let them come in legally. Not to be undocumented and work under the conditions that you're sort of describing. But you're, you're asking, your, your question about what's the future going to be, we can look to the past. Right now, people are doing incredible work because census data material has come out for decades now. And they're looking now also at 123andMe and some of those other kind of data, DNA things. And they're looking at immigrants from different places for the last 150 years. And what they're finding is, despite the rhetoric, today's immigrants, like you and you and everyone else, not yet in the 13 generations, welcome to our country. And basically, when you look at all that data for now, they can actually look at, there's almost no difference in success and integration and assimilation and opportunity and people achieving a goal. I mean, the, I mean, the data is almost irrefutable. That this perception that people are somehow not becoming uh, middle class or, or gaining some things over time is completely wrong. The difference between the, the Polish, the Italians, the Greeks, the Mexicans, the Salvadorans is almost non-existent over time. And that's, that's I mean, this new data is just incredible to think about because it answers your question, what do I think the future holds for us? I think the future holds for us a great, big, beautiful place <coughs> where we can all add to this thing we call America as we have for 200 years to create something that's different tomorrow than it was today, and that's the nature of the beast. That's what culture is. You know, America's not the same as it was 50 years ago. It definitely wasn't the same as it was when the Puritans came, right? You just think about this. As I tell my students, you know, before the Irish came with their whiskey, the Germans came with their beer, the Italians came with their wine, there was no parties in the dorm on Saturday nights. What do you think America was like? The America we know today was created by immigrants and their children. It's going to be that way in 20 years. Your kids, your future is going to make America different. And that's my future, the one I'm looking forward to, to live long enough to see what we become. Just go down to LA and you'll see it already. It's just the most, one of the most creative places in the world because of the kind of ideas that are coming into collision. And that collision is creating hybridities, hybridities in all kinds. I, was, I saw a line in LA one time. And I said, what are they lining up for? So I got in line. I mean, I'm curious to have a dollar. I'm going to tell you, what are you doing here? I see a mile up there, I see a lunch truck. I go, okay. I go, I'll have whatever they're having. He gave me a sushi burrito. I go, what is this? A sushi burrito. I mean, delicious. Why didn't I think of that? You only get that when you have cultures collide. So my future is a nation of cultures colliding. When you keep the old, I hope we never get rid of red chili. But you can have red chili with Korean beef in a burrito. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was wondering, okay, somebody mentioned, you know, this is a capitalist society. Um, I'm just wondering if those at the top and uh, those uh, who are doing the hiring, so to say, actually benefit from this very negative rhetoric. Uh, because again, they can have immigrants defined as illegal and they don't have to pay them uh, the amount that they're due for their labor. They don't have to abide by the rules of the United States. 
Uh, so again, I'm just wondering, in terms of this capitalist ethos, if there isn't a group that benefits by the exploitation of immigrants and by defining them as illegal, and then again, employing them you know, in very uh, low-level types of jobs where they're sort of paid under the table and, again, not what they're worth. Yeah, well, there's a lot there. The, uh, there are certain policies, as I stated at the end, saying we need policies that allow people to work with dignity, really. That's what it is. And those policies can shift the power dimension to the employer. So, for example, in 1986, we had the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which brought into being the, the employer's verification right, and, and employer sanctions. Very interesting. What did this do? Well, I was at a meeting with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who was then, and the, then the director of the INS, where these business people were all there saying, we don't want to be INS agents, we just want workers. And the guy said, don't worry, we're creating a loophole. We're going to create this I-9 form. We just get the worker to sign it, that they're legally here. They get prosecuted for, for basically fraud. You're off the hook. That's just the dimension. That means that person is now tied to that employer because they can't shift, right? But it's not, but capitalists, the work, employers don't often necessarily want that dimension. They just want workers, right? They just want people to work for them. I've interviewed a lot of employers, and for example, you know, they're saying in the labor shortage like this, they'll pay a lot. They don't care, but they can't get people who are citizens to come take these jobs. They don't care if the person's legal or illegal. They don't. They don't want to have power. They just want them to work so they can, their business can grow, right? And I mean, I've interviewed one guy in Newport Beach. You think that'd be a great place to work, right? Newport Beach, along the coast, making sailboats. And he goes, this is like 15 years ago. He goes, I'm not going to add the paper. I want to pay people $45 an hour. They come in, they start for half a day. You know, you've got fiberglass, it's hot. They leave. Then I get the immigrants come in, they don't leave. They work. I'll pay them whatever they want. I just want people to work, right? And so capitalist is about making money. And if you can make money in a way that the law allows you to hire people under the color of law, I think most employers will do it. Because that way they don't have to worry about raids, paying other kinds of fines. Not that they ever really did very much, but, you know, but the idea would be for an employer, which is the business of America, is to make money. They want to do it legally most of the time, I think, people I've interviewed. And you know, they don't necessarily want to, you know. <clears throat> there are some of the scrupulous ones, obviously, because when you give people the ability to hire people who are under the color of law, who, I mean, who aren't under the color of law, you have a lot of power over them, whether they're maids, whether they're people working in factories. That's what I'm saying. We should not have, I mean, people need to work, let them work legally so that you don't have this kind of exploitation kind of situations. And I think most employers would welcome that because their basic goal, as I said, is to have a business and make money. That's right. You're saying they would pay them the same? They often pay them the same because okay. in the tight labor market we have right now, they just want to get someone to work, right? That's what's going on right now. So, okay, we, I'm sorry, we need to wrap, but if you want to stay behind and answer the questions, sure. well, I, just want to mention, I actually own a restaurant in the city of Santa Fe, so if anybody wants to talk about alternative business models where we do actually benefit immigrants, let me know. Well, I, 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 buy, I go to this one place, it's on number one list of gourmet places, taco places in, in Orange County, and I believe that, you know, if you want to really pay the price of what a hamburger or a taco costs, which is pretty expensive, but everybody in that restaurant gets a living wage. Every single person. So you should go find the, go find employers often for exploiting people, and you're willing to pay what the food is worth without exploiting people. Okay? That's <laughs> really good to wrap now. So, um, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you coming to Santa Fe.